Hello, I'm Adam Rosenblatt, MD. I'm professor of psychiatry and neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University, and I'm going to speak to you on the psychiatry of Huntington's disease. These are my disclosures. In my opinion, psychiatric problems in Huntington's disease can be roughly divided into three categories. There are those mental illnesses that are common in the general population and that most physicians will be familiar with, like major depression. And uh, if you read about Huntington's disease, it's often uh, mentioned that they have high rates of depression and that that's one of the more common psychiatric problems. In fact, that was mentioned uh, by Dr. Huntington himself in his original description of it, uh, where he said that they had that form of insanity that leads to suicide. Um, a second category would be those disorders that are familiar to neuropsychiatrists and people that deal with brain injuries and brain illnesses but aren't so familiar to other physicians. Um, and these would include things like the disexecutive syndrome, which I'll describe in detail in a little bit. And then lastly, there'd be a category of conditions that really are nonspecific or hard to classify, like uh, insomnia or agitation or, or other things like that that don't um, automatically suggest a specific diagnosis. Now, I did want to stress that psychiatric disorders in Huntington's disease, they're very common. And uh, particularly in the earlier stages of Huntington's disease, they may be more debilitating than the motor dysfunction itself. And uh, they're also one of the most treatable aspects of Huntington's disease. So given that we don't, in the current times, uh, have a treatment that's going to bring about a, a, a radical change in the person's condition, if you can cure someone's depression or you can solve their behavioral problem, you may significantly improve the quality of life for both the patient and their caregivers. So I think that this is a, a very relevant topic. Let me begin with those mental illnesses that are common in the general population, but also found in people with Huntington's disease. These will be more familiar to most physicians, but when expressed in somebody with Huntington's disease, may have uh, some slightly different ripples or some special ins and outs of treatment. These would include depression and the very important topic of suicide, mania, obsessions and compulsions, and psychosis, by which I mean delusions and hallucinations. Depression is thought to have about a 40% lifetime prevalence in people with Huntington's disease. And sometimes low mood is not necessarily the presenting symptom. So uh, people with depression uh, can have a lot of other symptoms like anhedonia, which is the inability to enjoy oneself, or they can have a diminished uh, attitude toward themselves. They can have suicidal thoughts. They can have irritability. They can have changes in sleep or appetite. And so particularly in someone who may have trouble communicating, you may have to guess that they're suffering from depression on the basis of one of these other kinds of symptoms. Not everyone with Huntington's disease, not, not everyone in general with depression will march into a doctor's office and say, I think I have a problem with my mood. So you have to be alert to some of these other things. People with depression uh, frequently abuse substances, especially alcohol and things like tranquilizers or pain medicine. Uh, and sometimes depression may be made worse or even caused by a pre-existing substance abuse problem. So it's important to ask about substance abuse when you're evaluating someone with depression. Uh, for that matter, it's also important if you have enough of a relationship with them to ask about substance abuse in a caregiver who may seem particularly burned out. Um, you should not assume that a person who's depressed and has Huntington's disease is depressed because they're reacting to the fact that they have Huntington's disease. Most people with Huntington's disease, at least 60 percent, uh, you know, at any time and, and probably a lot more than that, are not depressed. And it's possible to be happy and to have a high quality of life. So if you're going to say that the reason that a person is depressed or suicidal is because he's upset about having HD, you have to ask yourself, why this patient on this day and why not the guy that I just saw yesterday who had the same condition and, and wasn't depressed. So I'm not saying that people don't have reactions to um, seminal life events like receiving the diagnosis or having to stop driving or having to quit their job or something like that. Um, I believe that uh, um, much if not most of the major depression seen in Huntington's disease is a result of the brain disease and has a life of its own. And so it requires identification and uh, assertive treatment. Um, patients, fortunately, uh, usually respond to uh, the standard treatments. So there's no one particular antidepressant, for example, that works better than all the others and one that's ineffective. Um, they can do well with supportive therapy, uh, with environmental changes and things that help to remoralize them, uh, and even with electroconvulsive therapy. 
I mentioned some of these before, uh, but here are some of the standard uh, signs and symptoms of major depression, and these are taken uh, more or less straight from the, the DSM-4, which is the diagnostic manual for for psychiatric disorders. And as I said, they may um, not be as apparent in someone who has communication difficulties and may manifest themselves a little bit differently, but these would include depressed or irritable mood, a loss of interest or pleasure in activities, which is sometimes called anhedonia, a change in appetite or weight loss. This can be tricky because many Huntington's patients lose weight anyway, and so that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sign of depression. Insomnia or hypersomnia, not at the same time, of course, loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, poor concentration, thoughts of death or suicide, a loss of libido, which is also very common in Huntington's patients, so it may not necessarily be a depressive sign, feelings of hopelessness, social withdrawal, and psychomotor retardation or agitation, which again might be tricky to diagnose in somebody with HD. As I said before, um, uh, pharmacotherapy is a mainstay, although certainly not the only treatment for major depression. And even in Huntington's disease, there's no single preferred antidepressant. Uh, you know, if anybody had an antidepressant that they could demonstrate worked better than all of the others, they'd make a lot of money. But it is important to realize that people with Huntington's disease already have a burden on their brain. It can help to sort of think of them as if they were quite a bit older than they really are. Uh, you know, sort of imagine that you were treating a geriatric patient, even if your HD patient isn't geriatric. So they're easily made delirious. So you want to be particularly careful with some of the older, more anticholinergic agents, such as amitriptyline. I'm not saying that even amitriptyline should never be used. If you have somebody who had a fantastic response to it before and they're very ill, it would probably make sense to use even a not preferred medicine that worked the last time. But it wouldn't be something that you would reach for straight away. Uh, most physicians would probably start with an SSRI because of their ease of use and their relatively low side effect profile. Um, and uh, as I'll mention a little bit later, I think there may be some utility of this class for some of the other behavioral and personality changes that you see in Huntington's disease, irrespective of whether or not the person has major depression. Now, depression in severe cases can be accompanied by psychosis, um, by which I mean delusions and hallucinations, or by significant agitation. And so sometimes you will also have to use a neuroleptic or antipsychotic medication in addition to an antidepressant. Generally, the newer so-called second generation or so-called atypical neuroleptics are better tolerated, uh, but they're not thought to be particularly useful for chorea suppression. So here we're talking about using a neuroleptic in someone who actually needs it as a neuroleptic rather than using it the way that some of the older agents like haloperidol are, are often used to suppress chorea. And so by this I mean agents like olanzapine or quetiapine. And I think these uh, probably offer the prospect of not altering the person's neurologic condition very much, uh, but uh, helping them with their agitation or their psychosis. Older uh, high-potency agents like flufenazine or haloperidol or high-potency newer agents like risperidone are sometimes used for chorea suppression. Uh, and um, some patients may find that purpose more acceptable. So there are times that you'd like to be able to give, say, a very irritable patient an antipsychotic medication and they don't want to take it because they think that you're calling them crazy or they don't like the idea of being on psychiatric medication. And they may find it acceptable if you say that there might also be some benefit in suppressing their chorea. Um, and so this is a way that you may get a foot in the door. Or some physicians may choose to do this uh, um, quite deliberately to, to try to do double duty. And that has its, uh, you know, its upside and its downside. But these older agents are often very well tolerated in low doses. And by low, I mean one or two milligrams of haloperidol or a half or one milligram of risperidone, uh, you know, similar doses of flufenazine. We're not talking about very large doses that, that might induce Parkinsonism. Let me discuss the very important topic of suicide in Huntington's disease. Suicide is alarmingly common in Huntington's disease, and I think that it may be a combination of factors. People with Huntington's disease have, as I said, high rates of major depression. They face a lot of bad life stressors like family problems or the loss of job or independence. And they also tend to have some personality changes which may result in a loss of inhibitions and problems with judgment and decision making. So if you have a depressed person who's also disinhibited, then that makes me worry that they might be at a higher risk for suicide than somebody who uh, just has one or the other of those characteristics. 
You should ask patients about suicide in a matter-of-fact way. There are a lot of myths about suicide. Some doctors worry that patients will never tell them the truth about suicide, or they're worried that they'll somehow plant the seed of an idea uh, in the patient's mind by asking about it. There's no evidence to support either of those things. And the fact that a patient is in your office discussing their depression with you means that at least part of them wants you to do something to help and wants to get better, and that's the part of them that you're trying to reach. If you think that your patient is having suicidal thoughts, then you have to try to assess the severity of it to decide what your response needs to be. So some of the typical questions would be, does the patient have a, a plan for how they might kill themselves? Does the patient possess the means to carry that plan out? Have they made preparations? Are there any supports or mitigating factors? So at one end of the spectrum, you might have a person who says that they wish they could go to sleep and not wake up, but it would never occur to them to kill themselves. They would hurt their family. It's against their religion. They think things will probably get better. That would be somebody who you might assess as being at fairly low risk. On the other hand, if you have somebody who says, I have no family support. I'm a burden on the world. I've bought a gun. It has bullets. I've been playing with it. That's somebody who probably belongs in a hospital. And so uh, there are going to be a whole lot of gray areas in between. And what decision you'll make will depend on the support system the patient has, how well you know them, um, uh, those kinds of issues. Suicidal patients should be assumed to have depression until proven otherwise. In my opinion, depression is by far the most common reason why Huntington's patients commit suicide. And I'm going to take a very strong position on this. It should not be regarded as rational. These people do not have to die. They have many years ahead of them. Most of that time will be good if their depression is well treated. And so uh, I, I'm hoping that nobody in my audience would do this, but resist the urge to look at it uh, in some sort of philosophical or existential way and uh, regard uh, suicidal HD patients as people who are sick that you can help to get better and go back to having a good life. Um, you need to take steps to protect the patient, and that might involve starting a treatment, making a referral, involving their support system, even if it means uh, uh, not respecting uh, what would otherwise be their confidentiality. This is a matter of life and death. So um, safety may have to trump other considerations if somebody is reluctant to have you involve their family or their friends or their other doctors. And it may include involuntary hospitalization. And I've had many people shake my hand and thank me for committing them and in some cases treating them against their will because they got better and they realized that what they were going to do didn't make any sense and they're happy to be alive. Um, and I sleep a lot better knowing that than I would sleep thinking that I had allowed somebody to die because of some misplaced notion of, uh, of respecting their, um, uh, their autonomy. Mania is also found in patients with Huntington's disease, but it's much less common than depression. Uh, mania is uh, associated with an elevated or irritable mood, overactivity, a decreased need for sleep, impulsiveness, and grandiosity, uh, people that think that they're very rich or smarter than everybody else or very powerful. Um, now, it's easy to confuse some of the symptoms of mania with disinhibition, uh, which is often seen in people with Huntington's disease. Mania it should be an episodic condition. It should clearly have a, a beginning, middle, and end, and not something that's present all the time for years. And I think one way that really helps distinguish it is to look for the so-called vegetative changes, like uh, a decreased need for sleep, or an increased interest in sex, or in food, um, and for sustained mood changes, rather than somebody who has irritable flare-ups from time to time. So I've certainly seen um, unequivocal mania in patients with Huntington's disease, but people who are just a little bit jocular or disinhibited probably don't have that condition and, and wouldn't respond to the treatments for it. Um, it's usually treated in folks with Huntington's disease with neuroleptics and anticonvulsants. I don't really favor the term mood stabilizer because I think it's, it's too vague, but um, anticonvulsants like uh, divalproic sodium or uh, lamotrigine or things like that. Uh, lithium is the most powerful and efficacious treatment for bipolar disorder in the general population, but it has a narrow therapeutic range and patients that become dehydrated or don't take it exactly according to plan can run into trouble and so um, it's generally not recommended as a first-line choice in people with Huntington's disease, but that having been said, I have used it uh, when uh, it was a very clear episode of mania, uh, so it's not that it can never be done. I also worry though that some people might be using lithium in patients that don't really have mania and so they might not get a very good result because of this confusion that I discussed. 
Obsessions and compulsions are symptoms that are also sometimes experienced by people with Huntington's disease. Obsessions are recurrent intrusive thoughts or impulses. Uh, so um, common ones have to do with things like uh, germ phobia, where somebody may worry that they become contaminated by touching things that have germs on them. Uh, or um, I've had people that were afraid that they had left the stove on or afraid that they hadn't locked the door and they had to go back and check things. I've had people that drove their car and were afraid that they had hit somebody and they would keep going around the block to see if they had hit somebody who was lying in the street. A compulsion is a repetitive performance of a routine uh, such as washing your hands and they're usually tied together. So in somebody in the general population with obsessive compulsive disorder, one usually drives the other. So a person may have a fear of contamination and germs and they respond to that by engaging in the compulsion of washing their hands over and over again. This full range of symptoms is actually pretty rare in Huntington's disease and, and in my opinion a lot of what might be described or misdescribed as OCD in Huntington's patients uh, are again some of these uh, sort of disexecutive changes in people's personality and behavior. So you'll usually see a piece of it. There may be somebody who tends to uh, get stuck on a topic and hang on to it uh, really tenaciously to everybody else's distress. Uh, or there may be somebody who's always fiddling with the thermostat or always checking the doors or checking the mailbox to see if the mail has come. Uh, and so um, it can't necessarily be regarded as the exact same thing as OCD. Um, that having been said, uh, SSRIs, which are the usual treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder, do often ameliorate uh, this syndrome in people with Huntington's disease. But before you do that, you have to ask yourself, does it really require treatment at all? So if you have someone, for example, who's going out to the mailbox 10 times a day to check the mail, and that's giving them a little bit of exercise and they're not upset about uh, the fact that the mail isn't there yet, well, that not, may not be something that requires to use a medication or to try to alter the behavior. It may be that you would say to the family that these kinds of changes aren't uncommon and that uh, if it's not that important, maybe they should just let the person do it. When we refer to psychosis in Huntington's disease, I mean delusions and hallucinations. Um, it is true that there are some people that can have a sort of an isolated psychosis in Huntington's disease. Uh, sometimes people will describe it as a schizophrenia-like syndrome, but, but a pure psychosis is actually pretty rare in this population. And so if you have somebody with delusions and hallucinations, you want to think hard about whether they're associated with a condition that we already know more about. So for example, people with very severe depression may have delusions that they're sick with cancer or that they've done some horrible thing or that they're going to be arrested or something like that. A person with mania may have delusions that they've inherited a fortune or that a, a famous person is in love with them or, or that kind of thing. So you might um, see if you can elicit the other signs and symptoms of a mood disorder. Visual hallucinations are usually associated with delirium. So if you have somebody who is grabbing at things that aren't there uh, or um, uh, seeing uh, shapes or things moving that aren't moving, you want to think about some of the uh, usual causes of delirium in Huntington's disease like uh, an unwitnessed blow to the head or a urinary tract infection or a pneumonia or something like that. Um, you may also see um, confusional states in people who are intoxicated with uh, medications that are being used to treat them. So patients may be overdosed or they may be taking anticholinergic medicine. If you don't think the person is delirious or intoxicated, then neuroleptics are the usual treatment for psychosis in Huntington's disease. Um, and they're often effective, but I would say that I've encountered a subset of patients that have extremely tenacious delusions. Uh, I can remember, for example, a woman who was convinced that her doctor was in love with her and she was receiving lovely messages from him across the lake. Uh, he lived on one side of a lake. This was true and she lived on the other side of it and she could hear him sending her these love messages across the lake even though it was a mile away. And I said, how is that possible? And she said, well, the sound travels a long distance over the water. Um, and she didn't respond at all to various antipsychotic medications that were given to her. And so in some of these cases, it may be that these delusions don't come from the same place that they come from 
in other uh, uh, delusional disorders or conditions associated with psychosis. And so what we try to do there is to avoid direct confrontation. You're probably not going to successfully reason with the person and try to use distraction and management of their environment to minimize the harm that can come from it. I'm not saying that we wouldn't try pharmacotherapy, but if it's clearly failing time after time, then it may be that, um, that it's a somewhat different animal and we need to use a, a strategy to contain it rather than try to make it go away. I'd like to move on to a new section now and discuss uh, some psychiatric disorders that are particular to neuropsychiatric patients. And this includes some very interesting syndromes that uh, many people may not have seen before if they haven't taken care of a lot of people with Huntington's disease or other kinds of neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, this would include the disexecutive syndrome that I've alluded to a number of times, apathy, perseveration and fixation, and irritability. The disexecutive syndrome has a lot of different names, um, and it's easy to recognize but difficult to characterize. Um, it includes uh, a sort of two sides to the same coin, both disinhibited symptoms and deficit symptoms. You could almost think of these as positive and negative symptoms of the disexecutive syndrome. So among the disinhibited symptoms would be things like irritability, impulsivity, perseveration, jocularity and silliness, and deficit symptoms would include things like apathy, indifference, and a loss of spontaneity. In my opinion, the disexecutive syndrome uh, is known, uh, depending on whether you ask a psychiatrist or a neurologist, uh, uh, by a bunch of different names. So you'll sometimes hear it referred to as hypofrontality, or people will be described as frontal which is kind of a pseudo-anatomical term because Huntington's disease isn't really a, a frontal lobe disorder, but there are a lot of connections between the subcortical structures and the frontal lobes. I think, um, frankly, pseudo-bulbar affect uh, is a, a, a very specific sounding neurologist term for the same syndrome. And you'll see it in many different conditions that affect the frontal and subcortical circuitry with slightly different variations depending on what the condition is. Um, it's very frustrating to families uh, because patients are often unaware of the symptoms and they really can't be reasoned with. And so again, uh, there are some medications that may help some aspects of it, but the mainstay of treatment is containment, environmental management, accommodation of the patient's needs and desires where possible, explaining it to the family that it's not uncommon in this condition, helping to revise their expectations and helping them to react better to the things that are often fairly humorous that can come up. Apathy is both an emotional and a cognitive syndrome. The apathetic person lacks an emotional connection to their activities and their surroundings, and then they also cognitively have difficulty generating new behaviors. Uh, they may be indifferent or even resistant to treatment, uh, and it's frequently confused with depression because they don't seem to take pleasure in things and they don't want to engage in anything. But when you interview an apathetic person, they don't have any mood symptoms, really. So uh, uh, an apathetic patient was brought to my office by his brother, and his brother was upset that he had tried to take him fishing for his birthday, and he had resisted leaving the house to go fishing. And then when they got into the boat, um, he had behaved the most normally of the day and he caught a few fish and he seemed to enjoy himself some more and then when he came home he sat back down on the same couch he turned the TV on and he didn't engage in any conversation about the day that they had had when I interviewed him I said are you sad he said no I said do you feel bad about yourself he said no I said do you think about suicide he said no I asked about crying spells none of this I said how come you didn't want to go fishing and he said I just don't care I don't know what everybody's getting so worked up about I was perfectly fine watching television all day so um, some apathetic patients are really not suffering. Now, we look at it and we say they probably would be living a fuller life if they engaged in more activities, and, and it's not a bad thing to try to get them uh, more mobilized, but you can reassure family members that their loved one may not be suffering or may not be in pain from this, um, and that they don't have depression. The drugs that are used to treat apathy um, include stimulants, uh, various forms of amphetamines, and antidepressants uh, from which you should choose those agents that are not sedating because that might make the condition worse. Particularly SSRIs are used, but really the key is non-pharmacologic management. Apathetic patients perform much better um, when they are um, given structure and when somebody else plans activities for them and when they're not asked to be spontaneous. So they do well with a regular schedule where things are the same every day and where there are um, activities that they engage in on a regular basis. They do better when they're stimulating things in their environment. They do better if they're not asked to make a lot of decisions and you avoid open-ended questions and activities. So if you say, 
I'm going to the mall, would you like to come? Whatever you want, the answer is no. But if you say every Tuesday and Thursday morning we'd go mall walking, they may fall into a groove and do a lot better. And there are a lot of positive outcomes from that, like um, interaction with their families, uh, exercise, better hygiene, uh, uh, keeping a sleep-wake schedule that matches other people. So even if the, the apathetic person never thanks you, there may be a lot of good things that come out of, of treating their apathy and, or managing it in that way. Perseveration and fixation are uh, uh, two other aspects to uh, the disexecutive syndrome or two other aspects to the kinds of changes that you often see in people with Huntington's disease. Uh, they have cognitive and behavioral changes that cause reduced mental and emotional flexibility, and they have difficulty switching topics and may become fixated on a particular topic. Uh, one man I knew uh, was fixated on his watch battery and when it was going to run down. And so uh, 10 or 12 times a day he would ask his wife, did she think his watch battery was going to run down? Maybe it was time to go to the mall to get another watch battery. What would happen if his watch battery were to run down? Nobody was ever able to explain why he had chosen that particular topic. Another lady wanted seven or eight different kinds of juice in the refrigerator all, at all times. And uh, she arrived very annoyed at the clinic because uh, they were running late and her husband had been unwilling to unlock the house and go back in to get her a different glass of juice before leaving on the long trip to see me. Um, again, as with these other kind of chronic changes, the management mostly includes behavioral strategies and family education, deciding what's important to intervene in and what's not important to intervene in. But there may be a role uh, for SSRIs and perhaps for dopaminergic drugs like amphetamines or amantadine. I, I can't back this up with hard studies, but this emerges out of many years of clinical experience. Irritability is a very common and distressing problem in many folks with Huntington's disease. And um, like the other topics I've discussed, uh, is usually best managed environmentally, but may also respond to some medications. Many people with Huntington's disease have experienced a loss of ability to regulate emotion, and they may have very rigid thinking, so they may both be more irritable all the time and also have explosive episodes when something sets them off. Sometimes explosive episodes in people with Huntington's disease can seem random because we may be talking about someone, as I've mentioned before, who has trouble communicating. And so the things that upset them may not be that apparent. But if you look at it closely, you can sometimes solve the mystery. So for example, uh, I had a gentleman one time whose wife brought him to the clinic and she said that he had thrown a bowl of eggs against the wall of the breakfast room in a fit of rage and she had no idea why it had happened. And it turned out that he was somebody who had a lot of trouble making a quick decision and expressing himself. And she had asked him if he wanted eggs or French toast for breakfast and it took him a long time to think of an answer and then he had decided that he wanted French toast and then it was taking him a long time to say it. And at this point his wife ran out of patience and she put the eggs in front of him and he was furious at this because he'd been trying to say French toast all along and he threw the eggs. So being aware of something like that and allowing somebody extra time to make a decision or extra time to express themselves uh, can, can be very helpful. You want to try to identify the situations that cause conflict and sometimes I may even have a family member keep a log of episodes of irritability and what seemed to set the person off. Sometimes it's even necessary to admit a person to, to an ambulatory unit uh, in order to observe them ourselves and find out is this someone who does better around company or someone who's best left alone? Uh, do they need a slower uh, time getting ready in the morning or do they get bored easily? Those kinds of questions. You want to try to keep the environment calm and structured, avoid head-to-head -head confrontation because people with this syndrome really can't be reasoned with and they won't back down. And you want to support the caregivers by, by listening and, and showing them that you understand what they're going through and encouraging them to, to activate their own support system and maybe to get other friends and family members uh, or even professionals to spell them in caring for the person with Huntington's disease. And it's important not to prescribe reflexively. It's very easy to over-medicate or over-sedate these patients. And if you have somebody that has an intermittent or infrequent problem with explosions, and you immediately follow up every explosive episode with uh, something like a tranquilizer or an antipsychotic medication, you're closing the barn door after the horse has escaped. I don't know of a medicine uh, uh, short of out-and-out out sedating somebody 24-7 that's going to utterly prevent episodes of irritability. And so you want to try to figure 
figure out what triggers them and see if you can manage the, the things that stimulate these behaviors in the first place. That having been said, the medications that are used include various antidepressants, again, my favorite SSRIs in these situations, neuroleptics, sometimes benzodiazepines, and sometimes anticonvulsants or so-called mood stabilizers. And now for our final category, those psychiatric problems not belonging to a distinct category. And so these are things that can be found uh, in just about anybody. They don't automatically suggest a particular diagnosis, but I'm going to talk about how they show up in people with Huntington's disease and how we look at, uh, at their solutions. And these would include delirium, which uh, we've already talked about a little bit, anxiety, sexual problems, sleep problems, and demoralization. Delirium is something that uh, will be frequently encountered by physicians that treat patients with neurodegenerative disorders or a geriatric population or both. And uh, it's important to be alert for it in Huntington's disease. The rule of thumb that I usually use is to remind myself that nothing changes rapidly in Huntington's disease. It's a slowly progressive condition. And so if somebody has a, a subacute or sudden alteration in their cognitive abilities or their level of consciousness or a new, you know, strange behavior, then uh, delirium should be very high on your list. It results from various metabolic, infectious, and traumatic causes. And I think the most common ones in people with Huntington's disease would include medication toxicity, dehydration, infections such as pneumonia and urinary tract infection, and subdural hematoma. Patients with Huntington's disease fall down a lot, they hit their heads a lot, they're not always able to recall having had an injury like that, and so sometimes an unwitnessed blow to the head may result in a subdural. I can remember a case of a, a woman whose husband called me up and he said, uh, Doctor, you warned me that nothing should change suddenly in Huntington's disease, and so I think you ought to know that I'm having trouble keeping my wife awake. She keeps falling asleep in the middle of a conversation. She seems really out of sorts. And I said to him, uh, could she have hit her head? And he said, I don't know. She does fall from time to time. And I said, well, I really think you ought to take your wife to the emergency room. And some of the things that she ought to have is a CAT scan of the head, a urinalysis, um, electrolytes, uh, you know, vital signs and things like that to see if it could be one of these causes of delirium. He called back about an hour later and there's this strange repetitive kind of whomping noise in the background and I said, what's that noise? And he said, oh, we're in a helicopter. We're being flown to shock trauma. Uh, she's got a huge subdural hematoma. And uh, she was operated on, uh, the, the blood was evacuated that day and the next morning she had a huge bandage on her head and was sitting up feeding herself breakfast. She probably would have died a couple of hours later if, if he hadn't intervened. Uh, so you want to be very careful about uh, sudden changes in the condition of Huntington's patients. Uh, delirium uh, can also be quiet. Not every delirious patient is foaming at the mouth and pulling out tubes and IVs. They may just be quietly abtunded and withdrawn, and so it may be misidentified as depression, uh, and you want to be alert to that kind of presentation presentation as well. Or sometimes um, if a delirious, quiet Huntington's patient is seen by a physician that doesn't know them well, they may think that their Huntington's disease is much more advanced than it is. And they're having a conversation with the family about entering hospice, and the family is trying to tell them that the patient was riding a bicycle last week. The treatment of delirium is alleviation of the underlying cause. So patients who are delirious and very agitated are sometimes given little doses of antipsychotic medications or things like that to prevent them from pulling out tubes, but that's not actually treatment of delirium. The treatment is finding out what's causing it and removing it. Um, you should never sleep well if you don't know why your patient's delirious. You should never discharge a patient that's delirious if you have no idea why they're delirious because there's a very high mortality rate associated with this condition. Anxiety is not a single syndrome, uh, although people that come in and complain of anxiety will see it that way, uh, but it's a final pathway for a number of psychiatric disorders. Uh, there are various things that cause anxiety in patients with Huntington's disease. Changing life circumstances that they may have difficulty accommodating to, changes in the brain, uh, which may cause depression or personality changes, and the interactions of the two. 
in order to try to ameliorate anxiety in Huntington's disease, you want to work it from all the different angles. So uh, a lot of patients with HD may be laboring under an unfair burden. They're being asked to make too many choices and too many decisions. They may be uh, being asked to uh, fulfill too many responsibilities for, for somebody who's already dealing with Huntington's disease. So while it's certainly a good idea to help people preserve their autonomy and help them to feel useful and important, sometimes it may be a weight that's too much for somebody to carry and people be become very anxious when they're trying to do the impossible. And so sometimes allowing somebody to take disability from work or to give up driving or to give up financial responsibilities may help their anxiety quite a bit. They may think they're going to feel worse and they actually feel better when they don't have so much responsibility. Uh, you want to try to simplify their choices and decisions. Episodes of panic should be medically evaluated at first um, to see if the person might be having some physical symptom, a heart problem, a respiratory problem, an infection that needs to be taken care of. The pharmacotherapy of anxiety problems in Huntington's disease is much like it is in, in the general population. It includes um, antidepressant agents. Uh, again, SSRIs are mostly the ones indicated at least for formal anxiety disorders in the general population, but some other antidepressants may help as well. Um, you want to be cautious with benzodiazepines because of their abuse and toxicity potential. They're not probably a good permanent solution, but their judicious use may help somebody through a difficult time. And then there are other anxiolytic medications that aren't antidepressants or benzodiazepines. But as I said before, be especially careful of very long-acting or anticholinergic agents, which tend to build up on people and may result in bad outcomes like delirium or falls. Sexual problems are common in people with Huntington's disease. I would say the most common sexual problem is a loss of interest in sex. And this can be very frustrating for the spouse or partner. So there may be somebody who's still quite functional in other ways, and their spouse is trying to enjoy their good time when they're still not that impaired by Huntington's disease, and then they've had a loss of interest in this very vital part of their relationship. Um, other times, less frequently, uh, you may have somebody who becomes sexually disinhibited um, and uh, the patient's spouse may not be willing to discuss this unless they're interviewed alone. So it's usually a good idea, especially if you're getting some sort of a sense that there's something unspoken in the room, to find a way to speak to the husband or wife by themselves and ask if there's anything that they wanted to bring up that, uh, um, that they didn't feel comfortable saying in front of the patient. And you may sometimes find out that there are episodes of sort of uh, uh, people with HD being sexually demanding or sexually aggressive. It may be very frightening for someone. Um, in uh, people that are sexually disinhibited, you may have a bad outcome like a sexually transmitted disease or an unwanted pregnancy. Environmental changes may help. So somebody with advanced condition, for example, who's um, being sexually aggressive with caregivers may need to, if it's a male patient, they may need to be given a male caregiver, for example. Um, in extreme cases, uh, sometimes antiandrogenic treatment in men will suppress the libido and may make it possible to care for somebody, say, in a long-term care setting who's too aggressive otherwise. Some sexual problems, I think, arise out of incompatibility between the patient and their partner as HD progresses. The spouse is making this very difficult transition from uh, sort of help meet to caregiver. And they may not any longer think of the HD patient in a sexual way. They may be uncomfortable about that and the patient may not see it that way at all. Or sometimes it can be vice versa. You can have the HD patient that's lost interest and the spouse still wants to have a sexual relationship. And the best thing to do is to try to have a frank discussion about what's going on. See if there are areas for compromise. See if there's an opportunity to at least hear hear about people's feelings and thoughts about it and try to resolve conflicts in this area. Sleep problems uh, will also be brought to your attention fairly frequently. Um, I would say mostly insomnia and it can have various causes. Uh, one is that uh, patients with a lot of chorea may have trouble falling asleep or if they wake up during the night their chorea may really restart and they may have trouble going back to sleep again. Um, chorea, as you probably know, tends to uh, be quite reduced when the patient is actually sound asleep, although not reduced to zero, but it can interfere with the person falling asleep in the first place. And so you might want to consider a strategy to suppress chorea, particularly at night, if you think that's what's keeping them awake. Uh, sometimes I've even resorted to sleep studies and that sometimes told me what it was that was keeping them awake because they had tremendous amount of movement when they were trying to go to sleep. 
Sometimes patients don't sleep well at night because they don't do anything all day. So there's a lack of daytime exercise and stimulation and so they're not really tired. Anyone who's raised kids knows you have to wear them out or they'll keep you awake all night and so it's the same thing with adults. Sometimes depression and anxiety cause insomnia. Um, I think in particular uh, with depressed patients, uh, people with a full syndrome of major depression sometimes have this problem called early morning awakening where they'll wake up at 2 or 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, not be able to go back to sleep. When you see early morning awakening, it's uh, particularly worrisome for depression. There are no perfect hypnotics um, and so there are various agents that are employed but there's really nobody born with a deficiency of sleeping pills in their blood. And so you want to try not to have to use it as a permanent solution. It probably won't work as a permanent solution because most people eventually accommodate to whatever they're being given. So you want to look at some of these behavioral interventions that might help the person sleep. But the agents that are often considered tend to be sedating antidepressants like trazodone, sometimes used in doses that wouldn't be enough to really work as an antidepressant but might make the person sleepy, sedating neuroleptics like quetiapine, um, and prescription sedative hypnotics like zolpidem. Benzodiazepines are almost always the wrong answer in this situation. Uh, the long-acting ones tend to build up on people and the short-acting ones generally don't last long enough to give the person a, a, a full night of sleep. Apathetic patients, on the other hand, often sleep excessively, especially if left alone, or if they don't sleep, they may at any rate stay in bed all day. But the interesting thing is that they aren't drowsy when they're engaged in other activities. So uh, if a patient is sitting in my office looking happy and the family says, well, he stays in bed asleep 20 out of 24 hours, and I say, well, does he fall asleep in the middle of a conversation? Uh, was it difficult to get him to come here? And they said, no, we just insisted that he get in the car, and the patient's wide awake there. That tells you that you're probably looking at an apathy syndrome, and it's not that they're hypersomnolent, it's that they, they don't feel like doing anything and they'll just take to their bed, and they perform much more normally if engaged and so getting them a regular schedule may be very helpful. Demoralization is something that can happen to anybody whether they have Huntington's disease or not. Uh, people with Huntington's disease experience a lot of losses usually and as the losses accumulate they can become demoralized. Uh, these losses include things like the loss of their job, the loss of independence or driving privileges, um, a feeling useless and guilty about inability to provide for one's family. And so when people experience a failure of their hopes and dreams, a loss of their sense of self-worth, and the onset of despair, that's what I would refer to as demoralization. And it can be hard to tell the difference between somebody who's demoralized and somebody who has major depression. In fact, a person could have both things. But again, you would be looking in major depression for things like vegetative changes and early morning awaking and these things that kind of tip you off that you might be looking at a disease syndrome and you might be looking for depression to not be clearly related to some recent life changes. The treatment requires a combination of psychotherapy of whatever type the patient can tolerate. Uh, I'm not necessarily referring to orthodox psychotherapy or inside-oriented psychotherapy. It might just be having the doctor express a you know, belief that they're going to get better, that the situation is going to improve, that they're there to help them, solving real-world problems and social intervention. Uh, so you want to solve uh, basic things like this person's had to stop driving, how are they going to get to their club in the afternoons to meet with their friends? Uh, what can be done to reduce stressors in the person's environment? How can you build up their support system and how can you recast the situation in a more positive light? And finally I'd like to end with some take-home points uh, which should be pretty clear uh, from what we've already discussed. Psychiatric problems in Huntington's disease are very common and can be quite serious, but they're also very treatable. You may be able to bring about more substantive change by addressing the psychiatric issues of Huntington's disease than any other part of the condition. So there's no reason to feel bad about it. This is actually an exciting area where you can feel good about the changes that you can help bring about for your patients. Some conditions are already familiar to most doctors, so nowadays in the 21st century most doctors have some facility with asking people about depression or asking people about substance abuse, but other aspects of it are particular to neuropsychiatric patients or to Huntington's patients or may be expressed in a way that's unusual if you don't have a lot of experience with people with Huntington's disease. 
I can't stress it too strongly that depression and suicide should not be regarded as normal in Huntington's disease. They might be common, but they're not normal. They're indicative of some very bad problem in someone's life or some disease process, and they can be fixed. These patients don't have to die. And finally, remember that not all behavioral problems in Huntington's disease require drug treatment, or any treatment for that matter. Sometimes all they require is helping the person's friends and family to revise their expectations and to try to contain problem behaviors by managing their environment. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this is a topic that's very important to me and very exciting, and I hope that you'll emerge uh, from this with a sense that there are many things that you can do to make life better for your patients with Huntington's disease in the psychiatric sphere.